Next, I'm gonna introduce our next moderator who really needs no introduction. Uh, Professor Kenneth Townsend is the Director of Leadership and Character for the Professional Schools and Scholar in Residence at the Wake Forest School of Law. A recipient of the Truman Scholarship for Public Service and the Rhodes Scholarship, he earned a BA from Millsaps College and a Master's in Philosophy from the University of Oxford and a, a JD from Yale University. A licensed attorney and frequent constitutional law or frequent commentator on uh, public affairs, He's taught courses in ethics, political theory, public policy, and constitutional law at Millsaps College, uh, the University of Mississippi and Yale University. He teaches professional responsibility and leadership and character in the professions at the Wake Forest School of Law. And as a student in both of his courses, I can attest he is the real deal. His research focuses on the relationship between law and morality, the role of religion in a democracy, and the ethical obligations of professionals. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Kenneth Townsend. Thanks for those kind words, Kyle, and thanks to Ethan. The two of you have done extraordinary work in putting this symposium together. And thanks, of course, to Professor Mark Rabel, who has been the brains behind this operation from the start. This is this represents his passion and life's work in so many ways. And I've been honored to, to be able to be brought along uh, for some of it. And thanks, of course, to all of you who have participated as uh, panelists or moderators in the conversation so far. What an extraordinary day we have had. Thanks to each of you. So here's, here's how our last session is going to, to go. Here in just a moment, I'm going to offer some short introductions for our extremely distinguished uh, final panel. And uh, then I'm going to set up some questions to get the conversation started, but I'm hoping to mostly get out of the way because y'all don't want to hear too much from me. Uh, we've got some impressive folks who have done some extraordinary work. And I'm really looking forward, and I know you, you know you are looking forward as well to hearing uh, from them. But without anything further, so I see that we have all three of our panelists um, here on the screen. I'm going to offer just a few words um, to, to introduce them, and then uh, we'll get going. So Chief Justice Sherry Beasley, uh, um, whom no doubt almost all of you already know, was the first African-American woman in North Carolina Supreme Court's 200 year history to serve as the Chief Justice. She served on the state's highest court since 2012 and was named Chief Justice in March of 2019. Justice Beasley also served for four years an associate judge on the North Carolina Court of Appeals and was a district court judge for a decade in the 12th Judicial District in Cumberland County. Before beginning her judicial career in 1999, um, Justice Beasley was a public defender in Cumberland County. Uh, Justice Beasley's commitment to fair and accessible courts extends beyond the halls of justice. She has mentored countless students and judges, lectures at area law schools, and travels nationwide and abroad to promote the rule of law, the administration of justice, the importance of an independent judiciary, and fair judicial selection. A graduate of the University of Tennessee College of Law and the Douglas College of Rutgers University, uh, Justice Beasley earned her LLM in Judicial Studies from the Duke University School of Law. She has held several leadership roles in the ABA and in the North Carolina Bar Association and has received a number of awards for her leadership and service. And now, just as a few weeks ago, she's back in private practice at McGuire Woods. Welcome, Justice Beasley. We're so glad to have you. Your name has already come up uh, earlier in today's conversations. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And now, Mr. Derek Johnson, um, whom I had the good pleasure of uh, crossing paths with a bit when I lived in Mississippi um, in my previous role. Uh, Derek Johnson currently serves as president and CEO of the NAACP, a title that he has held since October of 2017. He formerly served as vice chairman of the NAACP National Board of Directors, as well as the state president for the Mississippi State Conference of the NAACP. A longstanding member and leader of the NAACP, Mr. Johnson has helped guide the association through a period of re-envisioning and reinvigoration. Under his leadership, the NAACP has undertaken such efforts as the We Are Done Dying campaign, exposing the inequities embedded in the American healthcare system and the country at large, and the victorious 2020 Supreme Court lawsuit in AACP versus Trump, which prevented the Trump administration from rescinding the uh, DACA program for millions of young immigrants. Born in Detroit, Mr. Johnson attended Tougaloo College in Jackson, Mississippi. He then received his JD from South Texas College of Law in Houston, Texas, 
and then served as an has served over the years as an annual guest lecturer at Harvard Law School, lending his expertise to Professor Lonnie Guinier's uh, course on social movements and as an adjunct professor at Tuvalu. Mr. Johnson is frequently featured on CNN, MSNBC, CBS, ABC, among other outlets. So his face probably looks familiar to many of you, um, where he advocates on behalf of the black community and all of those who are affected by systemic oppression and prejudice. Thank you so much, Mr. Johnson, for being with us today. We're glad to have you. And, and finally, we have Judge Carlton Reeves, uh, whom I've had the good pleasure of getting to know over the years, again, back when I lived in Mississippi and I, whom I consider a, a personal hero in many ways. Uh, judge Reeves is a judge on the US District Court for the Southern District of Mississippi. He was appointed in 2010 by President Obama. Previously, Judge Reeves worked in private practice at his own firm, Paget Reeves Johnson in Jackson, and then was assistant U.S. attorney for the, and chief of the civil division in the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of Mississippi from 1995 to 2001. A graduate of Jackson State University and the University of Virginia um, Law School, Judge Reeves clerked for Justice Reuben Anderson of the Supreme Court of Mississippi before beginning his own legal career. The second African-American to serve as a federal judge in Mississippi, Judge Reeves is the author and number of many notable and groundbreaking decisions, including Campaign for Southern Equality versus Bryant, which struck down the state's same-sex marriage ban, and the United States v. Butler, which featured uh, the really horrific, tragic, race-motivated murder of 48-year-old Black man James Craig Anderson. In a speech last year at UVA, where he was awarded the Thomas Jefferson Medal in Law, Judge Reeves spoke out against present day attacks on the federal judiciary and called for greater diversity on the federal bench. So nice to see you, Judge Reeves. Thank you for being with us today. So to quickly catch us up to speed on where we are, this is our last session of the day. We've had a series of conversations focused on secondary trauma and the legal profession. And for those who haven't been around for the whole session, let me provide just a very quick overview. When we talk about secondary trauma, some of what we've heard about include some of the most horrific and acute uh, cases of, um, uh, of representing child sex, alleged child sex offenders and capital cases, some of the hardest work that lawyers can face in many respects. But when we've talked about secondary trauma, we've also talked about the various ways in which lawyers face serious occupational hazards, no matter what line of work they work in. There are things like billable hours, competitive workplace, occasional negativity and personality that lawyers uh, have to confront themselves, institutional factors, cultural factors, um, social factors at play that present various challenges. So I don't want us to feel like we have to focus simply on the most acute forms of secondary trauma in our conversation today. I want us to be able to talk about that as well as the broader challenges that just about any lawyer might face. As I alluded to, we talk, we've talked about institutional and cultural concerns as well as more personal um, sorts of concerns that lawyers face. So I'd like for us to keep that in mind as our conversation moves forward. We've talked a bit about COVID and the ways in which this pandemic has exacerbated some of the ongoing challenges that lawyers and the law profession faces. Um, this last panel that we just heard from was an extraordinary panel that focused on race and the ways in which the trauma associated with the system of law as well as the practice of law is, um, is uneven and um, disproportionately impacts people of color and our conversation focused in particular on, on black Americans. Um, so that's a little bit of the background that we've come from uh, so far today. This session is focused on lawyers taking leadership. And the reason that I've invited each of you, that we as a symposium have invited each of you, you all have had tremendous, tremendous legal careers and have embodied the best of the legal profession in so many ways. And when we think about ways of navigating challenges associated with the practice of law, one thing that I think about as, as an attorney myself is, you know, what, what would some of my exemplars do, right? What, who are some people in my life who have managed to lead through adversity um, and, and keep their head above water and to make a positive difference in the world? And certainly the three of you are, are um, very high on that list. So um, I think to get things started, um, what I'd like to do is, is, is pose this question related to exemplars, since I consider each of you an exemplar. I mean, who is someone in your own life that you have perhaps looked to as an example um, for navigating personal and or professional distress? And what is it about that person's example that you, um, th that you were impressed by? 
or that has shaped your life in, in some way um, or another. And if that doesn't prompt an immediate response, then I'm happy to, to pose another question. I've got a long list and I don't want to go through too many questions because I want to make sure the audience has a chance to. But uh, Justice Beasley, you're the first one on my screen. So I'm going to give you the opportunity first if there's anyone that comes to mind for you. But if not, I'm guess, guessing Judge Reeves or Mr. Johnson might jump in as well. Um, I, Professor Townsend, I'm really delighted to be here this afternoon and I'm truly honored to, to be on this panel with Judge Reeves and with Mr. Johnson, both of whom really have had very esteemed uh, records of service um, and, and I am truly thankful to be here. I, I really must say before I answer your question mm -hmm. that I came in on the end of the other seminar. Mm -hmm. And when I heard my colleagues speaking so poignantly about their feelings about the practice of law and how they've often been treated in courtroom settings and in other capacities. It literally made my eyes well. Uh, part of it is that I know them um, and, and Judge Weeks, I, I actually tried my first case in front of him as a young lawyer, so I, I know them, but, but, but it just frankly made me think about how we kind of do this all day, every day, and how often we're not really, I mean, I'm not really necessarily attuned to that. You, you face whatever that situation is. For me, it's easier to confront it and not just to move on. It, for, if I'm gonna be um, upset or quaking in my boots, if for me, if you're gonna be that either way, for me, it's, for me, it's easier to just confront that. And, my mother, as we talk about who sort of helps you think about how to navigate and she's passed on, but, but she was um, very forthcoming. You never had to really wonder what she was thinking. Now her approach was very different than mine, but, but, but for me, there really is something um, refreshing about just putting it on the table, um, calling it what it is. Um, and, and then we don't have to really dance around it. Um, you might be upset or angry or whatever that emotion is after you say it, but whatever that thing is for me that I'm feeling, if I don't say it, it's going to be worse. Um, and I also think that for ongoing relationships, it's not really fair to the other person uh, for them to walk away thinking that what they said or did is was okay um, and that I received it well. So um, for me, it's less about having a teachable moment for them and more about us having an understanding about where our relationship is and how it's really important for us to be able to move forward and likely work together uh, because of our respective roles um, and the like. So there have certainly been a lot of people along the way who have modeled um, how to navigate and certainly uh, Judge Weeks is one of those people and he, I mean, people do it differently and, 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 and just because people do it differently doesn't mean that they don't serve as examples for how you determine for yourself the right way to, to do it. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Judge Reeves, you're next on my screen, so I'm going to come to you. Um, <laughs> who are people in your life who have provided uh, examples to help guide you through challenging times? And, and so just so y'all can start thinking, in a moment I'm going to ask you about a particular maybe challenge in your own legal or, or personal careers. Yeah, uh, thank you, Kenneth, and thank you, Wake Forest, for inviting me. It's such a pleasure to finally meet Justice Beasley, uh, someone I've read about and seen over the last several years, and commend her for her leadership of the uh, North Carolina Supreme Court, where one of my dear friends uh, actually serves uh, Anita Earls. Uh, so, uh, and so, and and it's. And it's good to see Derek again. I don't see him often anymore. Don't see him often because he's everywhere except Jackson and except <laughs> around me. So uh, it's so good to uh, see him and serve on this panel with him. Uh, like Justice Beasley said, you know, our lives and uh, each of our lives are full of intersections of, of people in our lives at various stages of our lives. There are school teachers back in Yazoo City, Mississippi, who have influenced me in ways in which uh, uh, they, they, they still impact my life. Uh, you know, going back to the uh, eighth grade, a, a social studies teacher of mine, uh, Thelma McGee, uh, you know, uh, talked to us about 
two things I, I distinctly remember. She, she would be about the age of Emmett Till. And when we were talking about just a snippet, because this is eighth grade in Yazoo City, Mississippi, we know we didn't go into detail, but the pain that she felt in talking about them killing that little boy. And I, I only came to realize later in life that she must have been about the same age as he, about the time that, that he was killed. So that, that was somewhat impactful of me. But, but you know, growing up in Yazoo City, the school teachers, going to Jackson State University, Charles Holmes, Mary Coleman, Allie Mack, Katina Mullen Young, Roy D. Berry, Leslie McLemore, all of these great thinkers about, and, and people talking about trying to make Mississippi a better place, encouraging us to go off to law school, go off to graduate school, do, to do stuff away, come back home. And then you, uh, you go from there and, uh, you know, in my legal career, it was the man who gave me that first opportunity to be a law clerk. Justice Reuben Anderson, no doubt about it, took an interest in me, took an interest in a, 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 a guy who was in law school who wanted to come back home. And from there, we practiced together at the same law firm. And it was, and, and I, I heard the young lady about being the only black person in, in that community in Arizona and how stressful that was. Uh, and I know how difficult it is for people to be the only black, I don't know, uh, but I've heard stories of being the only black person in law firms. Where here, I was at a law firm with the man who mentored me and trained me. And I had somebody in that law firm uh, who I could always go talk to about every issue, about any issue. And so in formulating who I would become as a lawyer, just as Reuben Anderson would be that person, I think. And his, and, and I also had the opportunity to serve there on the court for a brief moment while Justice Fred Banks was on the court. And he and Justice Anderson were childhood friends, saw the, uh, uh, approach the law in a different way. Uh, people will tell you, Derek will tell you, Fred Banks is the smartest lawyer in the state of Mississippi deserved to be much uh, uh, on the fifth, fifth circuit or wherever he, he needed to be the SCOTUS even. Uh, and, and, and it's those individuals I think that have influenced me the most in my uh, legal career. And then of course, friends and family, uh, brothers and sisters uh, uh, and, and, and all of that have influenced me as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Judge Rees. It's, it's nice to hear all these familiar Mississippi names uh, here as I sit in North Carolina. Uh, so now I'm going to hand it over to someone else who spent a great deal of time in Mississippi, Mr. Derek Johnson. Thank you again for being with us. And uh, I'm wondering if you could reflect for just a moment as well about maybe somebody or, or multiple people who have provided an example for you as you've navigated difficulties in your own life. Yeah, sure, Kenneth. Thank you for the invitation. And like I should be in the audience when I'm on here with Judge Reeves and and, and also honored to uh, meet you, Judge Beasley. And uh, uh, like Judge Reeves, Anita Earls also is a, a good friend and we've done a lot of civil rights type stuff together. I uh, also feel like I should be in the audience because although I have a law degree, I've never practiced. Uh, and I made that decision uh, for multiple reasons, but one of the key reasons, uh, and Kyle to, as Kyle was listening to Carlton talk, uh, being a part of this enclave of, of what I thought were people who were giants, uh, both in thought and commitment and perseverance. Growing up in Detroit, first of my family to finish uh, college and, and getting to Mississippi, having no family there, uh, being on Tougaloo's campus created a level of exposure and freedom uh, that I didn't know exist. And I only realized it exists because of some of those giants. Uh, you know, uh, getting on campus and I can recall walking across the yard and, and everybody I met seemed like they said they were pre-law or pre-med and I had never uh, met a black doctor or a lawyer that I knew personally. 
And so when the advisor asked what my major was going to be, I said pre-law because I didn't want to take another math class uh, unless I had to. Uh, but in the midst of that, running across people like Hollis Watkins, uh, one of the original SNCC organizers in Mississippi and working with him and getting an appreciation of loving people. Therefore, we, it was important for us to work with community leaders and they were the experts of addressing the harms they seen committed around them and to, and, uh, to them and, and the work of organizing their voices to push their leadership forward, not for me to be forward. Uh, Benny Thompson, Congressman Thompson, uh, just owning your power, understanding that if you are in a position of power, it is incumbent upon you not to conform to a status quo that's not in our best interest, but leveraging that power to expand opportunity for so many others. Uh, Fred Banks, who is the longest serving member on the NACP National Board of Directors, a walk-in genius, a walk-in uh, history lesson. I, I, I often ask, I say, Judge, when are you going to write the, uh, your book? His response, because he's so humble, is, was well, nothing new I can say that had already been said. And I always disagree with him because there's so much to be said from his perspective uh, that will be enlightening. And to show how you can stand in your power, be clear about your voice, not conform to the status quo, and be accepted. Uh, Judge Reeves, in that same vein, uh, could recall prior to uh, him going to the federal bench and taking on fight because it was the right fight and not being afraid of people viewing it as political or partisan. Because there's so much around the question of justice that we have allowed people to redefine as partisan or political with this simple protection of equal right, equal protection under the law or, or just, just issues of justice and having the courage to stand up there. Uh, uh, Judge, I, I recall the time before you got appointed, I will go on name, it was an individual who felt entitled that they should be considered for a federal appointment, but they did nothing to help people. They were excellent lawyer, but they wouldn't take risk in their mind to help people to ensure equal protection under the law will be afforded to everyone. And so just being a part of that enclave and understanding that it's not me, I'm a part of a continuum of, of pushing forward to make democracy work for everyone. I love what you said there, uh, Mr. Johnson. Thanks, thanks so much for that. I think that really helps us move this conversation in an important direction associated with the pressures and responsibilities of leadership and of power, whether we like it or not. Uh, lawyers have certain um, power and certain responsibilities that, that come with that. And I'm wondering if, if all of you for a moment, this might be a hard thing for you all to do, but to maybe set aside the virtue of humility for a moment and reflect with us for a, a moment about a time in your own work where you feel like you have taken advantage of a moment that has presented itself and have used your power, your position, your role in a leadership capacity for good. Um, who would like to, to volunteer first? I'll, I'll take volunteers. If not, I, you know, I'm, I'm a good teacher, so I can cold call if, if needed. But any volunteers here for a time when you have you feel like effectively used your position, your power, your role in leadership for good. I'll volunteer. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think everybody here knows that I was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of North Carolina through December 31st of last year and uh, was no longer the Chief Justice um, after I conceded in my race. Uh, there were five point four million votes cast and I lost by 401 votes. Um, and, 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 and frankly, there were lots of moments when I thought it was important um, in my service as Chief Justice to yes, lead the Supreme Court of North Carolina and also the judicial branch of government, uh, but to also be thoughtful about the fact that we needed to be um, acknowledge um, this racial and gender disparities in our courts. Um, and we had to be thoughtful about the cases that come before our courts. And we really needed to be thoughtful and um, work on the out outcomes uh, of those cases in our courts. And so when George Floyd died and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor, and there were protests across North Carolina and this nation, um, and I, I made a statement, um, a public statement, uh, 
uh, denouncing racism and racist practices in our uh, courts in North Carolina. It was important to me as a chief justice uh, to lead by example. And though I had been doing that, um, the time, the right intersection of emotion and um, action on behalf of people across the state and the nation just made the statement timely in, in the way, only the way that it could. Um, at the same time, Chief Justice Burnett Johnson, the only other African-American woman serving at the time as Chief Justice woman, and by the way, there are no African-American women serving as Chief Justice in the nation at this time, but our statements were featured by the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times along with some other um, chiefs, um, but it was important as Chief Justice for me to be unequivocal about the standards of our courts, to acknowledge that North Carolina has had a very difficult history around, uh, around racial disparities in our courts. And, and, and so as a result of that, uh, the Supreme Court uh, approved uh, a commission on fairness and equity. And I was able to make those appointments before I left office. Uh, but there are true benchmarks about what's supposed to happen. And this is not just another facial commission uh, making folks feel good, but we just got to do things differently. And um, while we have great judges and, and DAs and clerks of court, we must acknowledge that there are problems. And, and it was great to begin having really important, constructive, but very difficult conversations about racial and gender disparities in our courts. Um, and then as a part of those conversations, really determine how we are going to be action-based. And I think we can ill afford as judges to say it's their problem, it's law enforcement, it's everybody else's, and judges and other court officials really have to take responsibility for what happens in our courtrooms. Um, you just had DA Satana D. Berry from Durham County um, on and Satana gets it. Um, she is the right kind of prosecutor with the right kind of heart. She is serious about justice and all the ways that she that all of us should be, um, but but that really should come from the top. And none of us should, because of our responsibilities and our elected offices and whatever. Uh, in fact, that's all the more reason when you have the platform that it's important to use it in that way. Wonderful, thank you for setting that example several months ago. I remember that was something that I, I noted um, I was still a relatively new North Carolina resident and learning my way around and it, it stood out to me and I was impressed. And thank you for setting an example now by volunteering and, and jumping in first. Um, thank you, Justice Beasley, for your leadership. Um, Judge Reeves or, or Mr. Johnson, who, who wants to jump in here? I'll jump in, uh, you know, use the empowers for good. I can recall countless uh, election challenges. Uh, you know, every election cycle, there be individual who could be running for the first or just running for office. And the system in many uh, jurisdictions were uh, structured uh, in a way in which if you didn't understand the rules of engagement in terms of counting or canvassing after the fact, you could lose or an election can be stolen from you. Uh, and I will always appreciate when there were a set number of us who would get caught uh, and go into the room and the, the dynamics would change. And in many cases, it will be the same set of individuals opposing uh, fair election processes. Uh, and I can recall Hollis Watkins making a comment when I first started working with him uh, that an expert is someone who know a little bit more than everyone else in the room at that time. Uh, and it was very clear when uh, certain individuals show up in the room that it would change the dynamic. Uh, the air was shipped uh, in a way in which those who were seeking uh, just to be considered for office in a fair and open process, uh, you can see uh, a, a level of comfort, uh, which was always a good thing to see, particularly when you uh, consider some of the rural areas and set of individuals who had always done things a certain way, way and the way they were doing it uh, was neither legal or just. Uh, when you walk in a room, that dynamic change uh, that, that's that's is, is multiple examples of that that I will always uh, appreciate seeing individuals being able to do that. Thank you, thank you so much, um, Judge Reeves. It's your turn now. 
uh, with respect to uh, the, I guess a couple of things sort of uh, stand out. Uh, uh, the, the people back here in, in Mississippi, my friends and people who know me well, uh, always they know that I always wanted to be a judge. They know that. They, they, they know that I always wanted to be a, a federal judge because my view of judges are judges are heroes because but for the fact of judges, uh, we in Mississippi would not have the rights or the privileges even uh, that others, Mississippi, we just wouldn't be able to do it. We had to go to court. Black folk had to go to court to get everything, whether it's swimming in a swimming pool, voting, being in school with uh, uh, other students of other races, uh, proving to them that they are as smart as, uh, that they are as smart as you are. Uh, but for the fact of judges, none of that would be possible. So for the longest, I always wanted to be a judge. So there is, there may, in, in, in some person's mind, there may be an easy pathway to it, whether you run for it or if, if the stars align themselves in ways uh, that uh, they, 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 everything comes together. Uh, if it's an appointment, the, the politics of it all works out. There are choices that people have to make at some point in time. I was uh, the president of the Magnolia Bar Association, which is the, the predominantly African-American bar association that again, rose up and became necessary because black lawyers were not allowed to be in the Mississippi bar. So it is a thick, it is a bar association that still exists. I knew I wanted to be involved in that bar association and ultimately I became a uh, president. But through working with, again, the giants, the people who showed us I stand on, these other lawyers back here, one of the big pushes at the Magnolia Bar over the decades was the lack of African-American judges, the lack of judicial diversity, and there were all these appointments coming up. And, and now I'm, I'm one of the leaders. I'm not the president at the time. I'm my, uh, I might be one of the other officers, the, the, uh, the president-elect or even uh, the, the, the secretary or just a member. But there were nominations going forward and all that. And the Magnolia Bar took the principal position that there should be some diversity with respect to the nominations. I'm the second African-American to have been appointed to the federal district court here, or well, the federal courts here in Mississippi. From 1817 to 2010, I'm the second one. The one immediately before me was uh, Judge Henry Wingate about 1985. So from 1985 to 2010, not, although there had been about but somewhere between 18 and 23 nominations from coming out of Mississippi, not one of them had been African-American. And Derek and I, Derek and many others were involved in that, uh, in pressing the senators, taking public stances and pushing and cajoling and arguing and all that. And I had been counseled my friends and colleagues, maybe you should step back. Maybe you should not do this. You want to be a judge. But I thought that it was the right thing to do and it was the only thing to do. And, and I tell young people that, you know, you have to, people who might not agree with you on some things, most instances agree with the passion that you might bring to something. And they will respect you for that passion that you have to your uh, pertinent cause. So, so when the opportunity came up and my nomination was being considered, there was no real pushback. Even from the senators who we pushed up against with respect to our, uh, 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 with the respect to the prior nominations. To make one sort of detour. The other thing is with the power that I now have. Uh, 
a, a couple of cases, many cases, uh, you have the opportunity to write and think about it. But one of, uh, one of the cases that I had was a challenge at Mississippi's, what we call Mississippi's Confederate flag. Uh, there was a, uh, a, a lawyer filed a lawsuit, said Mississippi's still carrying this Confederate flag. It's a stain on me, it hurts me and all that. Well, I ruled that the young man did not have standing to bring the claim, but it was important for me to at least tell the other side of the Confederate battle, uh, the Confederate image that we here in Mississippi have been told. For example, Mississippi seceded from the Union, not because of slavery, but for some other reason. I don't know what that other reason was, but that's how we were taught. That, that's how they taught. That, that's public schools, the United Daughters of Confederacy and all of that. So in addressing the standing issue on the flag thing, there's uh, several pages of what one might consider dicta but it tells the other side of the story as to why Mississippi separated from the Union, the Confederacy, the, the lost cause and all of that stuff. And so it was important because I'm in this position now where my voice can be used to tell what I consider to be the truth. I'm gonna jump in on that uh, for the law students. Uh, one of the things I learned early is better to be respected than liked, but you can only be respected if you know your craft. And knowing your craft is really important if you want to own your power. And once you own your power, tell the truth on how this justice system can work for everyone. Equal protection of the law is a great phrase, but it's a reality that a lot of communities have been pursuing, particularly African-American community. And it's so important to ground a value proposition there, know your crowd. And there are gonna be a lot of times that people are not gonna like where you, the direction that you're going, but they have to respect it because out of that respect, the judge reads when, when it was being considered for that first federal appointment after about 10 years of fighting to make sure that was diversity on the court, not only did, uh, did the senator, both the senators agree, I received a call from the former governor's nephew to say, uh, please tell, uh, he said Carlton, because they knew each other from when they grew up, that uh, Governor Haley Barber is going to support him if he's going to be considered. But that's unheard of because almost everything that was being advanced during his tenure of governor, uh, we fought against. It was vocal, it was clear, but at the end of the day, because Judge Reed knew his craft, he stood in a value proposition that you couldn't dispute, although you might not have liked and you disagree with, but you couldn't dispute it. He was clearly the person that was gonna be the federal, on the federal court, but more importantly, because of the fight Every federal appointment during the eight years of the Obama administration were African-Americans because over time we made the case of the lack of diversity. So we're talking about two district, federal district court judges, a circuit court judge, the head of rural development, uh, both U.S. attorneys, both uh, U.S. marshals, all because we made the fight. It was a long fight, it was 10 years, but we were very clear, it's better to be respected than like, and we knew the principles for which we were fighting for. So well put, thank you, thank you both. I, I mean, there's so much that, that you all have just reflected on. I'm gonna, for the audience benefit, I'm gonna draw out a few of the things that, that really stick with me now and then, um, then move our conversation forward. And we're starting to get some questions from the audience as well. So very shortly, we're gonna move to those. Some of those connect very well with some of what you all have already said. Uh, but building on what Mr. Johnson just said, the, the long view, um, it's important. What I'm hearing from some of you here is that you have to not simply think about what seems um, easy in a given moment, but you have to be prepared to take the long view and to work for what you believe in. Um, you have to be prepared to own your power, to use Mr. Johnson's phrase. And in doing that, one way of doing that in a profession like law is knowing your craft. 
being well respected for the work that you do and um, and not running from the responsibilities that you have. Uh, something that Judge Reeves said in, in writing the opinion on the state flag, it reminded me of a class that I taught just last week about the role of lawyers and of judges in particular in um, you know, promoting civic mindedness and helping us understand the context in which our system, our whole system operates. And I think that's one of the things that you have done about as good as anybody, Judge Reeves, in your opinions. I'm reminded of the McClendon opinion from a few months ago on qualified immunity, which ended up telling just a, a beautiful and at times painful story about race in America. Um, maybe some of that was dicta, but you know what? It was important to tell that story. And so uh, how do we how do we use whatever role we have, whether it's as a judge, an activist, a leader of a nonprofit organization, or just an attorney in private practice to promote civic mindedness? Um, something else that you noted, Judge Reeves, about how to, how to balance your passion and, and zeal for diversity on the bench, uh, on the one hand, with potential concerns that some folks had that, um, you know, if you're too loud, um, you might upset some folks and you have to kind of put your head down maybe to be a judge. And this leads, I think, to the first question from the audience that we're going to bring in here, which I'm going to read and then also maybe elaborate on just a little bit. So this is directed especially towards Justice Beasley and Judge Reeves, although no doubt, Mr. Johnson, you can probably weigh in as well. As judges, I'm quoting here, as judges, how do you grapple with wanting to stimulate positive change in your communities? as it relates to racial justice while maintaining the impartiality and professionalism from the bench that judges are expected to have. I think another way of thinking about this is, do you think of yourself as a judge? Um, how do you balance a concern to affect positive social change while also not losing your ability to be a neutral, you know, impartial judge? Um, so Justice Beasley, would you like to jump into this, uh, this question and then we'll hear from Judge Reeves as well? Well, I think actually the non-judge probably put it the best, um, that equal justice under the law is, is equal. <laughs> and, and it doesn't matter whether you're a judge or not, um, that there is no uh, equivocation around what that really means. Now, yeah. each of us has our respective roles around how we make sure that we promote that, but, but it just kind of is what it is. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do think that um, it, it's really important to um, I mean, when I was the chief justice, I was very clear about what my role was. I, I was not an activist. Um, I was the chief justice. And when I made the statement about George Floyd's death and uh, the impact of racial disparities on our courts, there was nothing at all inconsistent with my role as chief justice and the leader of the judicial branch um, and acknowledging that there are racial disparities in our courts. And if courts are inherently supposed to be fair and just, actually that statement um, and the work around that, because that was just one of the many things that we were doing around uh, making sure that uh, we were not imposing excessive fines and fees. I mean, that's, a, that's, a, that's an equal justice um, mission um, and a whole host of things and setting fair bonds and, and that kind of a thing. All of that is really consistent with being the chief justice. Now, whether prior chiefs uh, acted in that way or not uh, is something different, but so much of that is driven by culture. And often it's comfortable to do what folks continue to do over and over again, rather than thinking about um, why each of us is called to serve for the period of time in which we serve. And so for the time that I served, my two years as Chief Justice, um, it was not to be comfortable. Um, it was not to go along to get along. It was to really be thoughtful about how can we make sure that justice is really accessible to everybody. Uh, when we have more than half the folks who come into our courts who represent themselves. Um, and there's one kind of justice that they receive when they represent themselves. And there may be another kind of justice when one is represented by a lawyer that chief justices have to be clear about uh, what the standards really ought to be in our courts and really have to be. Um, and, and I think so much of that was made easier because so many judges had been feeling the desire to do something, but just didn't know what to do. And I'm saying judges, but court leaders, generally speaking. And so to have those folks in partnership was, it was really important and I think led to, to, to a lot of great success. In terms of my work in the communities, my, that hasn't changed for me. I mean, I, 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 you know, I, no, none of us can take it all on, right? But, but you know, it's been really important to me to 
I mean, I've always weekly um, gone to a low performing school and read every week uh, to, to first graders. That's important to me. Hunger, even as chief justice, I did it every week. Um, and, and another thing that's really important to me is hunger. Um, in North Carolina, one in five children before the pandemic was hungry. And during the pandemic, one in three. Just think about that. One in three children is hungry. And so, uh, and so many of my efforts have been that way. So for me, so much of that, um, as, as, we, as we heard the prior session talk about, you know, the things that sort of weigh on them, it's important for us all to have balance. And, um, and so, and to do what we do well, um, it, my role was not to be an activist. And so that I'm not taking that piece on. Um, and, and I will say, you know, as I think about my life after the bench, I served as a judge for 22 years. I was, I thought I was gonna win my election I, and I hadn't thought about what my life was gonna really look like. And so now I'm a, a partner at a law firm um, and that's really exciting. And I'm actually thinking about a US Senate run. So, um, but, but I'm saying that to say, um, it, as difficult as uh, being a judge or a lawyer might be, and whether the things happen to us or we're facing discrimination as, you know, as, as practitioners, um, and, and the, 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 the question before in the other session about whether or not this practitioner should leave the, 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 the city or not, one of the things we have to think about is, you know, and I will say this inartfully, but, you know, if you go, you know, you also go with you, right? You know, so, it, it, you know, we think about what running means and, and, and placing yourself in another situation. When I went to college in New Jersey at Rutgers, people always had these notions about what it was like in the South. And my thing is, you know, I kind of, if I'm going to have some racism, I kind of like my Southern racism better than my Northeastern racism. It's, it doesn't feel the same, right? And so, um, you know, leaving doesn't solve the problem. You know, it, it doesn't mean you can't leave and you can't do something somewhere else, but there are, there are always um, issues everywhere. Um, and we have to just commit to be in the journey um, and, to, and to do so in a way that makes things better for people around us and for people who come behind us. Thank, Thank you, you so for much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Justice Beasley. Judge Reeves, it, clearly this is something that you've given a bit of thought to based on something that you said a moment ago about how you can kind of promote change, but also be viewed as and actually be a type of judge who can uphold the responsibilities of impartiality as, as expected. But I think that the flag example that you raised a moment ago is a case where, you know, if, if you were to design things from scratch and weren't concerned about the law and questions of standing, you, you maybe would have ruled in a different way, but you had responsibilities as a judge as well as as a human being. And, and how have you balanced these concerns over the time? Yeah, uh, one thing is understanding that, you know, judges are human beings too. And unlike what we sort of grew up on learning, legal realism is that once you put on the robe, you become a different person. No, you don't. You're the same person with a robe. So all the things that have come into your life and has caused uh, that has molded you, it's still with you when you become a judge. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a, a black judge's experience is uh, quite different, I think, uh, uh, from a white judge's experience. First of all, uh, there are not many of us. Mm -hmm. uh, just like that, when we grew up in Yazoo City, the people who were our leaders were, uh, I guess, to some degree, were the, as far as professionals go, it was teachers, preachers, maybe. Uh, but you rarely, you didn't see lawyers. You didn't see doctors, really. Not, not, not near them. So as a judge now, I, I, I still think that I must be that person who must, uh, who my group of folk depend on. But my family members talk about it all too often. I mean, I'm asked. Why can't you do something about it? Why can't you do something about it? Because you're a judge, why can't you do something about it? And so I think our responsibility 
is to make sure, yeah, yes, there are canons of ethics, there's rules and stuff, but there's that, but there are opportunities. We, as long as you're talking about justice, and, and you know, we, we should be honest with ourselves. Uh, equal justice under the law does not exist. The word equal does not, I mean, it just does not exist because equal means everything is the same no matter what players are changed. You know, two plus two equals four. And if you turn that around, four equals two plus two, that's what equal justice should look like. But we know it does not. And we have to uh, uh, accept that and, and understand that we have an added responsibility, or at least in my mind, I may be, you know, speaking out of turn with, with some people. In my mind, we we do as African American judges and as judges and uh, and as judges, period, because every judge takes the same oath, and every judge must have to take some responsibility to make sure that the persons who are involved in the in the process whether uh, unintentionally or intentionally. You, you either invite it there willingly or either you cause yourself to be there because you initiated the process. What we want to do is make sure that whoever is involved in the process, once their process has concluded, that if they or have to go through the process again, the first thing that they want to do is to go back and do it the way we did it before. We would want them to feel that way. And I think that I have that responsibility, uh, uh, Kenneth, to make sure that that folk feel like uh, they are invested in the system and that the system protects them in all of the ways that it protects everyone else. There's something really powerful about what you're, what you're saying, the integrity of the legal system. You as a judge and, and we as lawyers in various ways are responsible for upholding the integrity of the system. And I, I think implicit in, in what you said as well is an acknowledgement that you know, we've heard this phrase equal justice under the law several times so far from each of you in, in different ways. This is not a self-enforcing ideal, right? This is an ideal that we have, but it doesn't manifest itself. It requires people to manifest it. And you as a judge, if you are helping realize equal justice under the law, that is not an exercise in partisanship. That's not an exercise in bias if you are taking steps to help realize equal justice under the law. Absolutely. Um, thank you. We've got another question from the audience I'm going to go ahead and bring in here and, and again, maybe elaborate on it just uh, slightly to allow us to, ex to expand the focus um, uh, just a bit. But the question is as follows, how can lawyers and judges lead the fight against secondary trauma in the legal community and how can we improve resources for those impacted? And so that's, that's the question and my slight elaboration on it is as follows. We talked a moment ago about examples in your own legal careers where you have assumed the responsibilities of leadership and have acted in a way to promote good. Where are there areas that you see within legal education, within the legal profession, within the operation of law, uh, broadly conceived, where people, the system, are not assuming roles of leadership, responsibilities of power to affect good? Where is there improvement to be had? Where do you look around and see the greatest need? And of course, there you could probably talk all day about some of these areas of need, but what are some that particularly come to mind and how do you think that we as lawyers, judges can make a difference? So I'll start off. Judge Beasley, she touched on it slightly, of the lack of public, a true public defender system uh, that's well-staffed and equitable is a huge problem all across the country. It's not a Southern problem. And it creates a level of injustice uh, that it, it is in bad uh, need of repair. Uh, secondly, when uh, the uh, Congress gutted the appropriations for legal services, it also crippled the ability of everyday citizens, particularly uh, African Americans, in our case, from being able to utilize uh, the legal support 
around a myriad of issues, whether it was redistricting or you name it. Uh, we lack in our legal system true representation because of money. And there's always been that tension in this society between a, having a true democracy under a capitalistic system. And in that tension, you have this scenario where when democracy is weak or is being manipulated, capital exploit people. But if you're able to strengthen democracy, you can keep capital in check. And that plays out in our court system as it does in all, in all areas of life. And so that, that inequity really bubbles up when you look at mass incarceration, that inequity bubbles up when you look at uh, the lack of true representation of our tax dollars to support uh, the quality of life that citizens should be appreciating, particularly when in many cases they are paying more than their fair share in taxes, but not seeing those dollars come back into those communities. And when you look at low wealth areas, their, the data from their, par, their poverty index are, is being used to leverage federal funds from CDBG, but those funds are not being applied in the communities in which they live. And all those areas is where you see the lacking of some legal support where we need to really sure up. Great, thank you. Excellent examples. I can tell that this is something you've thought a little bit about. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Um, Judge Reeves or, or Justice Beasley, which of you would like to jump in here? You mute. Judge, Maybe you mute yourself, Judge okay, Reeves. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll jump in for just a second. You know, uh, how can one be involved uh, and do, you know, advocate in whatever roles you're in? Uh, you know, take the responsibility uh, and not only support certain candidates for certain your causes, but to actually run yourself. And I know that 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 says a lot to actually run yourself. Uh, but 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 I do think we need we need more responsible citizen leaders, more educated citizens leaders, more persons who have the fortitude to 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 push back against what they might be fed uh, by the lobbyists and, and all of that. Uh, we, we, we see it here and everywhere else. So I, I think uh, you should uh, uh, advocate, uh, be involved in the public policy debates, uh, be involved in the religious community uh, and, 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 and confronting the issues that they confront. I mean, it's just so many different ways in which uh, 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 particularly you as young lawyers, I, you know, I, I say this to the young lawyers out there and to the law students, you have to understand that you will be given so much power when you take that uh, oath uh, to be a lawyer. You will have the key to the courthouse. Judges have made it, judges and the legal profession. And once you become the lawyer, you have the key to the courthouse. Nobody else has a right to represent anyone else except a lawyer. You can represent yourself, but you cannot represent anyone else. You cannot represent any cause by yourself unless you are that lawyer. And as a lawyer, you have that key to the courthouse and you must unlock that door for the purpose of doing justice. One of the things that, I, that I'm sort of pushing my colleagues, when I say colleagues, I'm talking about judges across the country, as well as law schools, law students, I'm doing my best to encourage many more first-generation students many more African-American, many more people who have of affinity groups and whatnot, people who've never had access before to become judicial law clerks. But the only way you become a judicial law clerk is to get judges to, to hire you. So I'm pushing my colleagues. I'm saying judges, you need, to, you need to think about adding diversity to your chambers. You need to think about bringing in more women. You need to be thinking about African-American, Indian, Hispanics, gay people. You need to be thinking about 
this. And, 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 and as you think about it, judges, and I've told my colleagues this, as you think about it, judges, please give them the benefit of being a white male. And what do you mean by that? Because I've heard judges, I've talked to them. You know, they, fortunately, I have not had an experience of, of, of having a bad law clerk yet. And I don't expect to because I do everything I can do. I select a person. So this says a lot about you if you select the wrong person, but that's, that's a lot. <laughs> but, but you might have a bad experience with law clerks. And I've, and I've had my colleagues talk about the bad experiences that they've had. Person couldn't do the job, slept, you know, whatever was, was uh, uh, but uh, invariably they've had bad experiences with white male clerks and their next set of white uh, their next set of next set of clerks is a white male so i tell them please give that african american or that woman the benefit of the doubt uh treat them like you do that white male clerk in other words if that first female falls on her face and doesn't do the job please don't penalize that great female that's waiting to get through the door just because the one before her did not make it. We don't do white males like that. So no need to do everyone else like that. So one of the things that I'm involved in now is this judicial diversity as well as law clerk diversity and making sure that these opportunities are available to, to all these, but you can do it through legislation, advocacy, and all that. And, and I'm sorry, one final thing. I do have a connection to North Carolina, I like to say, Justice Beasley. 1988, I worked for what I consider the best law firm in the country in Charlotte, North Carolina, <laughs> Ferguson Stein Law Firm. That firm inspired me to come back to Mississippi to do exactly what they did. That was a firm of white people, black people, women, and every, everything along the strata who did public interest work, who made money, who did criminals, who did everything because it was for the good of Charlotte. It was for the good of North Carolina. And it was a fully integrated firm. And, I, and, I, and, it, and, and it, it, it inspired the firm of Piget, Reeves, Johnson, and Minor. It was the template that we used. And that and the Piget Reeves firm was founded in 2001. And it was, I think, the second integrated firm in Mississippi. The first one was with Reuben Anderson, Fred Banks, and Mel Leventhal from the late 1960s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I, so 1968, 69, 70. So another 30, 40, 34, uh, 30 years being had by the news. So, you know, those are the things that I sort of focus on and talk about. And this whole diversity push that you might hear in several of my speeches is all inspired by this whole thing that we can work together and we can do great things together. Uh, and, and we can make it make sure that, you know, we, we, we pursue that goal of of equal justice and making this country more perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you, Judge Rees. Um, Justice Beasley, what, what, what would you like to share here? What are the things that you see when you look around as um, growth opportunities um, with respect to the legal profession, legal education, um, capacity to navigate occupational hazards, secondary trauma, the challenges of law? I would pick up on the point that Judge Reeves about lawyers being empowered. Mm -hmm. uh, we are at a place where we are experiencing a pandemic like nothing we ever could have imagined. Mm -hmm. um, that's compounded by heightened racial tensions and um, governmental institutions and corporations and law firms and a whole lot of folks are trying to figure out how to do better. And I think as lawyers and as law students, um, really, we can ill afford to kind of throw our hands up and say, you all go figure it out. Mm -hmm. If you think about every single moment in this nation's history, 
where we've had these crises, it's really been lawyers who've been at the forefront of using our court system to change people's lives. Mm -hmm. It's been lawyers who've been thinking about um, how to be innovative to work through crises. And certainly they've partnered with other folks from other professions, but lawyers have always led the way. Mm -hmm. And so I hope your students really are in inspired that even those are these are difficult situations around the pandemic and heightened racial tensions, and frankly, the insurgency on January the 6th, which if you care anything about this nation and democracy, you should be moved by. Um, however you are moved, that lawyers really do uh, have a wealth of opportunity to uh, change people's lives and to make uh, communities stronger. And, and I hope that your students feel that sense of empowerment even in their state. And I know it's easy to sort of find yourself buried in your books, but don't lose sight of the import of this moment. Uh, because it doesn't just impact you, it also gives you an opportunity to, to make contributions in some very powerful ways as law students um, and as, as lawyers. Um, the other thing I would say is um, we're getting better about it, but we don't talk about it enough. And lawyers are called upon to lead the Red Cross Committee and the Diversity, Equity, and Conclusion Committee, and the NAACP as the CEO, and all of these really wonderful things, and practice law, and be judges, and all that. And it is important. And when you compound race, gender, uh, fluidity, and everything else on top of that, it is important for us to take care of our mental health. Mm -hmm. And it is so important um, that if whether we or with somebody that's around us, we see them struggling, that we tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, Jan or Fred, maybe you should think about getting some help. It's nothing to be ashamed about. It's nothing to be embarrassed about. And we can only be our best when we're taking care of ourselves. And it's not selfish. Um, uh, Self-love and self-care are very important, especially during these very stressful times. And so I would just encourage um, your students to do that. And the other thing I would say is we've talked a lot about race and gender and uh, diversity. But I would encourage, as I'm now on this side of it, and I'm a part of an international law firm, which is great, I uh, hear a whole lot about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, and my bottom line, and I've been very frank with my firm about this, is we just have to make the commitment. And we have all the programs we want, right? Um, but we have to know the benefit, not just for diverse lawyers and diverse clients uh, that, that we be engaged, but the benefit is for everybody. Uh, we're all wealthier when our law firms are diverse. Um, and when I think it was um, Judge Reeves who said earlier, you give the same chances to Bob's son uh, who came in because Bob was a great lawyer than you do to Letitia who has come in, doesn't have any lawyers in her family, first generation. Trust me, she's got a lot of experiences that, that, and experience and, and, and brilliance that got her where she is. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've got to think differently about what good practitioners look like. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. I mean, there, there are a number of questions that have come in, but I'm looking at the clock here and I see that we've kept y'all an hour and two minutes already. Um, and I know that you are extremely busy people. This has been an absolute delight for me. And I know it has been for everybody who is watching from last I heard we had over 30 states represented in some way or another. It's signed up for this, over a thousand people who'd signed up to take part at some point in the day in this symposium. Thank you on behalf of everyone. Thank you for sharing your wisdom, uh, your stories, and I know that we're all better off because of it. Um, I think at this point, I'm probably supposed to wrap up our session as much as I don't want to. I'd, I'd really love to spend more time with y'all, but I hope to to have a chance to reconnect um, or to connect uh, at some point in another uh, context, maybe even in person one of these days, who knows. Um, and I, I believe at this point, uh, Kyle or Ethan is going to come on and officially uh, wrap things up. But if, if I'm supposed to do anything different, one of y'all tell me I'm supposed to do something different and, and I'll follow your instructions. Thank you again, uh, Judge Reeves, Justice Beasley, and, and Mr. Johnson. Very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so on, on behalf of the Wake Forest Law Review, we would like to thank all of our attendees that tuned in today. Uh, we'd also like to thank our panelists and our moderators for their incredible contributions to this awesome event. Uh, and also thank you to our wonderful sponsors, the Wake Forest Program for Leadership and Character, the Wake Forest Department of Psychology, the Wake Forest School of Medicine, Wake Forest University's Provost Office, 
the ACLU of North Carolina, the Innocence Project, and the Forsyth uh, County Bar Association. Thank you also to Dean Aiken and the Law Review for being so supportive, and thank you to the IT people for keeping this webinar afloat. Uh, finally, thank you to our awesome online editors, Chris Flurry and Andy An Anderson, who have been instrumental in helping us market this event. Uh, and also thank you to our incoming symposium editors, Kelsey Rector and Gabe Marks, and the rest of the, the Wake Forest Law Review for all of their support. This officially concludes our event, and thank you so much for everybody uh, who attended.